Love that video. Never get bored of it. Good evening, Mark. How are you doing this week? Hi, Ali. I'm really good. I find myself dancing. It's a bit of an embarrassment doing a bit of dad dancing here at home to the video. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody that's watching from home, uh, really excited this evening, our show is all about being a successful middle leader, we're going to do things slightly differently tonight Mark aren't we, we've got a panel discussion and we've got three fantastic guests across two different schools, um, I'll just do a really quick introduction of uh, who our guests are, so we've got Neil Statham who is uh, SLT and Head of P at Heartland International School in Dubai, you can find him online at uh, Neil Statham. We've also got from Heartland International School as well, Year 4 leader Hayley Pierce, uh, currently doing her MPQML. Uh, you can find her online at Miss P underscore DXB. And then uh, from my own stomping ground, we've got uh, Vicky Jewett, uh, Head of Humanities at the British International School of Abu Dhabi, and you can find her online at The Jewett. Brilliant. I'm, I'm really excited about the show tonight, Ollie. And what's been lovely, actually, um, you know, I can't believe we're already this far through into our second season. Uh, it feels like only two minutes ago um, you know, we were we were having started our conversations about um, you know, season two, what the episodes would look like, and and then we had this crazy idea we should maybe like think about having a conference, and that's all coming together really, really nicely, isn't it? Uh, super excited about the conference. If you haven't seen uh, what we're planning, here's a le another little video uh, to uh, wet your whistle. So absolutely, really, really, really looking forward to this on the 16th of October. Uh, massive thanks. Um, the platform we use and, and the things we put together um, do cost me and Ollie a bit of money. So we have got some sponsorship uh, to support us with the event that we're doing on the day. And uh, really uh, proud to be being supported by Classroom.Cloud. Uh, we're also being supported by Guess and uh, by National Online Safety and Teach Middle East magazine as well, which is, I think, Ollie, actually it's a really really lovely endorsement that um mm -hmm. particularly guests and teach middle east magazine given their their um uh, their prominence in the region i think it's mm -hmm. so lovely that they are supporting us with our our endeavors because so we, we didn't get into doing this to try and make any money we just wanted to try and find uh, and use um social media to sort of help everybody and share and, and uh, in issues that are surrounding the region so it's as lovely that guests and um, Teach Middle East are, are, are joining us and supporting us alongside National Line Safety and, of course, uh, our, our major sponsor, uh, Classroom.Cloud. Uh, we're looking to um, sort of wrap things up and tie the agenda up over the course of the next week. So there's still a chance if you want to uh, have a chance of speaking at the event, then please do visit learnliveuae.com. And uh, we can try and squeeze into our already pretty packed agenda. And if that's something that's of interest to you, uh, then we are trying to get as broad and diverse a range uh, of voices and speakers uh, for the event from the region. And so please do visit learnliveue.com in order to uh, um, fill in the application form if you are interested in speaking. Uh, the agenda, as they will be uh, announced by us on our show next week. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really excited. It's coming together really well, isn't it, Ollie? Yeah, and just, you know, to, to add to what you said there, to have the backing of, of you know, the fantastic group of people um, that kind of align to our vision of, of what we want to achieve, of connecting and collaborating with people, is, is really great and uh, it feels like a great bit of validation there. But not only that, it's it's the, you know, the classroom or corridor conversation, so to speak, that we have with people, the guests behind shows that, and also validate those those ideas that um, you know we have of trying to actually achieve um, hearing from such a diverse range of people across the region. You know we have little pockets of things where, for example, the UAE, UAE Research Schools Network. But to be able to do that on a on a on a slightly uh, more open and larger scale has been fantastic and great to actually share learning from educators across. The MENA region. So I'm super excited for, for what lies ahead for the 16th. Yeah, absolutely. Me too, Ollie. And whilst we're here, should we just have a quick um, uh, um, wetting of the whistle uh, for live viewers of who our next uh, two guests are going to be on the next two week shows and then run up to the conference? 
so, well, we've we've got a few more shows uh, lined up. Um, we've got a, a researcher teacher show. So we've got uh, David Pedder lined up, who is um, he works at the uh, Emirates College. Um, so and is an educational researcher by trade. So really looking forward to um, having that kind of dialogue and open discussion and debate with him about how we can access educational research and make it tangible and work for us in the classroom. Um, we also have uh, lined up by popular demand, Tom Sherrington, um, author of not only The Learning Rainforest, but um, Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction, um, along with... Uh, I'm trying to think of walkthroughs and a whole host of books so you know really excited to have um those people lined up for the show to share uh, and engage in debate with teachers from across the region yeah really really excited about the conference and say our next two guests and um as a, a, a duo who try to be responsive to the needs of the region as well, if you've got any ideas for shows uh, that you feel would be relevant to um, teachers and uh, leaders from across the region, uh, please, please, please do get in touch with us either via the learnliveoe.com site or obviously Ollie and I are very um, easily accessible through our uh, two Twitter accounts uh, at ICT Evangelist and at O Lewis underscore coaching. Uh, but I think we probably talked ourselves enough now, Ollie. Should we uh, bring in our guests? Uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll bring our guests in now. Here we go. Yeah, so, it's a big welcome to Neil Statham and Hayley Pierce and Vicky Jewett. Thank you so much for joining us today on Learn Live UAE. Um, how are you all doing? How are you doing, Neil? Yeah, doing great. It's uh, it's great to be back in school. Great to have kids in the building again, and we're we're about four weeks into it now, so we're finding our feet and hitting our stride again. So yeah, happy to be here, and even more glad that we're not following Tom Sherrington <laughs> because he'll be uh, that'll be some uh, some interview, I'm sure. Really looking forward to that. How are you today, Haley? How are things going with you at work? Yes, very good. Um, same as Neil, really. Just glad to be back in the classroom. Um, to have the children back in front of me rather than through the computer screen, which was just tough to get through. So really glad to be here today as well. To oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, Hayley. And Vicky, can, so can I just start by asking, can you give me the lowdown on what Ollie's actually... I, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, th thank you so much, Vicky, for joining us today as well uh, from BISAD as well. How are things with you, Head of Humanities? How are things for you in your department and at the school? Yeah, really good at the minute. We, today was our first day for actually having live kids in senior school back in the building. Um, so it's been like quite a hectic, mad run up to that. But it was so lovely to see them all again. And just to sort of it just walking around an empty school just doesn't feel right. So it's been a really great day today. I think we're all a little bit tired and a bit like, oh, so exciting. But um, yeah, it's been really good. Oh, that's so fantastic to hear. Um, Ollie, are you ready with the first uh, question for our, our guests? Yeah, obviously we've uh, we've given you a, a very brief introduction, but um, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your experience in education so far? If we start with Vicky first, please. Sure. So um, I started teaching in the UK about 13 years ago. Um, and I was a teacher for a year and then I became a middle leader. So I've been a middle leader for what appears to be ever. Um, I worked in the UK for about three years and then moved to Singapore. And I worked there um, until last year um, in a private uh, international school in Singapore. As a, I started off as a teacher, then became the head of geography and then the head of humanities amongst many other roles. Um, and since then came to BISAD last summer um, and I'm the Head of Humanities there. I'm loving it. Uh, should we go to Hayley next, please? Um, so I am currently in my eighth year of teaching, um, moved to Dubai in 2015. Um, said I'm coming for two years and then now going into my sixth year here. I think that's like many people that come over here um, been at Heartland since it opened, so seen some huge changes um, in the school from there. And this is my first year of middle leader, and I think I'm currently, I think it's week five, so week five of middle leader, so I'm very, very new. 
um, but really enjoying the role. Teach primary, so currently year four, year four leader, um, but I've taught across all primary ages from year one to year six. Um, but yes, that's that's me. And finally, to Neil. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Neil Statham. I have been teaching for, I, I was trying to count them. I'm going to abandon the number of years teaching and just <laughs> leave it, a, you know, comfortably teaching for teaching for a while now. Um, I've been uh, in various leadership roles, I think, for the last eight years now, um, leading PE in primary school, then into through school, uh, leading on specific subjects, um, PSHE, for example, and I'm on a comment at the moment into senior leadership uh, at Harland International School. Um, so part of that has been innovation and in some of the ed tech that's taken us through distance learning, and then some other things as well, like home school um, student leadership. And in my, you know, you might not guess it looking at me now, but a few years in kilos ago, I, I had a somewhat successful rugby career as well. Uh, and I captained the, the UAE rugby 15s team and seven aside team, um, which which hopefully gives me a different angle on leadership experience to talk about this evening. That's really interesting. Some of the best books I've read in recent years about leadership have actually been from pre previous um, sort of coaches and and, um, and sports players. Uh, it's been really interesting to read those things. So it'd be really good to hear your insights around uh, sort of that link to education, but obviously with, with a sporting slant as well, Neil. Thank you, all three of you, for your responses there. Uh, jumping on to um, one of the first questions, um, I'm going to jump, uh, Ollie, on to question three as it goes. And I think it ties in quite nicely to the conversation we were just having. Um, can I start with you, please, um, uh, Vicky, if that's all right? And what advice would you give to someone looking to step up into middle leadership? Um, I think just for me, I, well, I heard this really good pearl of wisdom on a course that I went on. And it was about that leadership is about practice and it's they sort of made the analogy of it being like yoga that you practice and you practice and practice and hopefully you get better and better and better at it. So don't be put off um, at first of applying for a leadership role if you don't have any experience, because I think it's mm. the kind of the, the industry that we work in. You learn really, really fast, obviously, as we've all done in the last sort of few months. Um, but just educate yourself. I think to be a credible leader, you need to be quite well read. Um, and you need to sort of keep up to date with stuff that's happening um, in schools and in educational theory. Um, and just, you know, work hard. People respect you if you work hard and they're more mm -hmm. inclined to kind of get on board with the stuff that you're doing and, and work with you if they see you sort of pulling your weight as well. Yeah, that definitely goes to that whole sort of uh, um, walking the walk, not just talking the talk approach, doesn't it? Absolutely. Thank you for that. And um, Hayley, how about yourself on that on that question? Yeah, I think um, just trying to find kind of the role that you're interested in. Myself personally, um, I knew that I wanted to go into a middle leadership role, but perhaps wasn't sure at the beginning what particular role I was was looking for. Um, mm. Just finding out what kind of role you want. Is it a subject role? Is it a kind of pastoral role? Um, I guess that depends on what kind of school you're in, but also um, whether you are a subject specialist teacher or a primary teacher um, mm -hmm. like myself. Mm -hmm. And I think um, just finding somebody that's in the school already who perhaps has a middle leader role or um, has a role that you are interested in, kind of shadow what, what they're doing um, or see what the role entails. So ask some questions. They've obviously been in it um, they know what to expect so shadow them see what see what you can learn from them um mm. it's really important mm. um and then i think for me personally more recently i've kind of been more into the twitter side the educational side and there's there's so many great people that you can follow on there and find out things about so that's definitely something to latch on to and use yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot, lots of great advice being shared by many people, and there's so much great reading out there as well. But before we went live, we were discussing uh, Andy Buck's uh, Leadership Matters book, which is a great uh, book to uh, sort of dip into and refer to around leadership. Uh, jumping to you, uh, Neil, same question. Um, so when it comes to thinking uh, about uh, uh, being a middle leader, uh, what advice would you give to someone looking to step up about um, 
how to go about it and, and uh, all things sort of surrounding that. Because sometimes it's about knowing that you're ready, feeling right, that you're ready to do it in, in yourself, isn't it? Um, yeah. Teachers suffer massively from imposter syndrome. And what advice would you give, Neil? Yeah, I, I, I can definitely relate to the feeling of uh, imposter syndrome, for sure. I think my key piece of advice I would be is that you have to make sure that you have your why, first of all. And I think, you know, it's easy in school and in career to sort of think of this as a conveyor belt process and first you become a teacher and then you become a year group leader and then everyone has to follow this um, set path and some people some people never step on that path and they're quite happy being um, a fantastic teacher which is brilliant and I think if you decide that you want to go into leadership you have to have your your reason why why is it that you're doing that is it to develop yourself is it to develop people is it to develop a subject or an idea that you've got that you're convinced that is right but I think you have to be secure in yourself um, in what it is that you want to do and why you want to do it and it sound, might sound like cliche advice but then I think the, the the journey into leadership becomes a lot more straightforward after that I think once you have your your ideas and your beliefs and you sort of grow get the confidence of conviction in them uh, it becomes much more uh, much more easier to lead people um, and I would also say try and spend as much time as you can around great teachers and, and great leaders I think Haley touched on the role model subject there but you know I still I, I'm learning lessons in leadership every single day it doesn't matter how long I do it for and if there's a decision that you might have made or I try and imagine myself making a challenging decision and ask why you know if I, if I would have concluded something different I try to always find out what was the thought process behind that decision? Why did you Why did you do what you did? Or when faced with a difficult decision, you know what is it that you're weighing up in your head? And try and you know by by osmosis and just be a, be a sponge around these great people. And lastly, make sure that you you know you're confident in what it is you're doing as well, and spend time learning your craft. Um, mm. I was really fortunate teaching in Scotland to start off with. There were two absolute you know titans of the subject in my department. And I spent every minute that I could in their lessons watching them, making sure that I was secure in my, you know, my day-to-day -day craft and tried to be excellent in what it was I was doing, my, you know, the sort of the bread and butter of teaching and teaching PE before I, I wanted to step further into leadership. So a kind of a, a, a trifecta of advice there, <laughs> there for you. Uh, it's great to see Sorry, Mark. I was just going to say it's great to see the, the kind of the discussion go full circle there with um, sort of starting about, you know, honing practice um, with Vicky and, and coming back round to um, the response there um, of, you know, spend time with those around you that are, are great at what they do. But alongside that, knowing that you you have this guiding mission, whether it is to improve the the pupil outcomes in a particular subject or you want to play a pastoral role or you want to grow and develop others so it's great to see um those responses and parallels between um the three of you we've had uh, a comment come in from jane uh, thank you jane as a middle leader how do we identify teachers that have the potential to improve or teachers who cannot improve and need to be replaced uh, i'll open this one up for debate if anyone like, would like to jump in I mean that that's a it's a it's a big old question that I'm going to try and dive headlong into it and I think for me it's about trying it's about trying to develop people and I think the moment that you 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 think you've identified someone that can't improve you do you do have a problem on your hands but I would kind of I would bounce it back a little bit and say you know what would you what would you do in a situation where you had a student and you thought um I, I don't know if we'd ever give up on a on a student like that when you said uh, maybe give up's a bit strong but you know we would never say that someone can't improve and I think be, being a good leader for me is about is about trying to develop people and it's about trying to help people um so I, for me it would be a kind of redoubling redoubling your efforts on that and there's there's always a way that you can help someone improve they, they do have they would have to want to get better themselves for sure but I think um I, I would apply that similar logic really that you would do if you had a student who you were struggling to improve you wouldn't you know you would find what it was that motivates them or I would go back to my sort of my starter <laughs> starter for 10 which is to, you have to find the why and if, if you don't have a why then it's going to be difficult once you can find the why then the path forward is there it goes quite 
Sorry, Sorry Vicky, carry on. I was going to say, I think you also need to be supported with really good processes as well. Having kind of managed people through um, performance management systems and things like that, if you've got um, a parallel system that supports teachers who are struggling or who aren't really um, achieving good pupil outcomes, I think if the school that you work in has a really good process of dealing with that, of trying to help them and to take all of those steps that Neil was talking about, um, in a kind of fair and documented and, and really sort of kind way. If it's still not working out once you've gone through that process, then I think you've got your answer then, haven't you? That, you know, you've tried everything you can. And, you know, if, if the person isn't able to take that on board and to develop themselves, then it's kind of time for them to go. Yeah, I, I concur, and I, I was going to reflect on that um, quote, and I'm terrible at, at, at quoting things verbatim, but it was Dylan Willem, who, who you know, educators would widely recognise as being a you know, leading authority on teaching and learning, and he said uh, that teaching is such a hard job that no matter how hard we try, is we... we and it, it wasn't exactly this, but he said he, he said something along the lines of, um, we will never be you know, absolutely brilliant at it, Um because there's so much we still need to know about how we learn, how, how people are, psychology behind it, all of those different things. And so, you know, it's, it's about like Neil saying, and, and yourself, Vicky, there about, I think, about um, providing those opportunities to be kind and work through those processes to support people when they do need some support. Um, th thank you both for those great comments. And thank you to Jane, too, for, for that particular question. Um, we're getting questions from our audience uh, right through um, and uh, welcome to long time uh, supporter long time sufferer mark ryan uh, who is apparently very excited for this chat um he asks um uh, how are middle leaders being supported during these very challenging times with covid and i guess that question and i'm jumping right through to some of the later questions here but one of the things i found most difficult as a middle leader was balancing the expectations of slt whilst being really mindful and supportive of the, the people in my department and my teams and and all the rest of it and it, you sort of feel like you're pushing that back a, a little bit to, from the above and 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 i was trying to be really supportive underneath and i'm guessing uh, that links quite nicely into mark's question here so um uh, i'll jump to you vicky with that one if that's okay um how, how do you think middle leaders are being supported during these challenging times with covid um, it's been quite mental, if I'm honest. Um, I think because we've sort of been pulled in every direction, as you were suggesting there. Um, for myself, I feel that I've been massively supported by my team and that we've had a real sort of camaraderie and um, just really sort of pulled together. Um, so I'm super, super proud of them. And like every time we talked, somebody was, oh, I've tried this and this has happened and Maybe some days people had had like a really tough day for whatever reason, um, maybe nothing to do with school even. Um, but just to have to to have created a really strong network through social media and just through kind of our day to day routines, um, I have felt massively supported by my team um, when we've sort of felt quite distant from the physical part of school, actually mm. sort of emotionally we've still felt really strongly a team. Um, so that's probably not what you were expecting and not perhaps what I was expecting either, but I'm, I'm really heartened by it. And I think we're a really much stronger team now as well. I said, out of adversity comes strength, doesn't it? Neil, you, you've been on both sides of the of, of this, really. So you're SLT now, a bit of former middle leader. Um, what, what would your response to, to Mark be in relation to what he's saying? And also, how about balancing the pressures from above um, whilst being supportive of your team uh, as well? What, what, um, what's your response, Neil? I'm, I'm just conscious of what I'm keeping half an eye on Haley here. <laughs> As someone who I've hopefully been working through that process with, so if she starts shaking her head, just just kill my <laughs> microphone. Um, I think in times like this, I kind of relate this to sport. I think people think that they, in times of pressure, when it gets difficult, people think that they need to throw the like the hail mary in American football. They need to do something completely out of the box. But really, when we're trying to get schools back to normal, what you want is teachers teaching with children. You know, you want great teachers spending. As much time as possible with great children doing the core business of teaching them so 
for me, or for our, for our team, we tried to spend as much time as we could looking at the, the logistics and the how-tos. You know, I think when you, you just have to flick on the news or go on tests and look at some of the articles and the problems that people are facing, like, you know, how am I supposed to, how can I do this and how can I do that? And I think we, we have tried tried as best we could to take away as many of those how questions and, and let teachers focus on what they do best. And I think that there also has to be acknowledgement that you can sit and plan this in a room. And one of the things I've got written on my board behind me, which is something that I do do believe in, is that sometimes your your ideas are not the best ideas, and that goes for all all levels of leadership. And you can you know there are things that we thought we planned perfectly, and then I think you have you, you can never be too proud to go to the people who are on the ground implementing it, living it day in day out, and ask them if it's working. And if they tell you no, you have to. You have to be willing to listen to them and willing to accept that it, it's you know maybe you didn't call this one right yeah I'd, I'd agree with you you both completely there i think it comes down to relationships doesn't it and, and part of that is the culture within your school and being able to have that honest open dialogue and and feedback no matter if it's horizontally or vertically within your um, within your school. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, um, Neil, you might, you've probably read this, Legacy by James Kerr um, to kind of go down the sporting avenue. You know, one of the things that the All Blacks focus on is the little things. And it's those accumulation of all of the little things that you do that build up to um, improving the bigger picture, not only for the teacher, but for the middle leader as, as well as the, the senior leader. So I think that's a, a really important important point to sort of take there and i hope that that uh, helps to to add to your your great responses there to mark's question i'm going to change tact ever so slightly uh, and come to to you Haley. um as a middle leader um how do you go about growing um all of the members in your team what sort of strategies uh, have, have you got planned for and have you been using in the past couple of weeks yeah, so I think um, obviously you need to get to know your team first of all. Um, the, the team that I'm working with um, have both been at the school before, but I haven't necessarily worked closely with them. So just getting to know them first of all um, and kind of working out what, what do they want to improve? How can we improve um, the team in general? Are there things that are working? What's not working? Um, so to grow the team and then what do they want to improve? So do they have some areas like we were saying before i think everyone no matter how long you've been teaching for no matter how long you've been in leadership for you can you can always find um something to improve on no matter how big or small that improvement is um and kind of letting them uh, work with you well how are you going to achieve that goal um and just take risks as well. I think it's quite important. It's one of our kind of attributes at, at Heartland of, of risk taking and, and let them go with that. If they've got a great idea, um, let them let them try it and see if it works. And if it doesn't, we come back to it and try the next thing um, to help them, them and the team team grow. Ollie seems to be distracted. I think he's tweeting about what you're seeing there, Haley. Thank you so much for that. I, I completely agree. And it goes back to what Ollie was saying a second ago. I think about relationships as well, because, and this links into research from Hattie. And it's interesting when you, we, we, as educators, we often look at research when in, in relation to children, but we forget sometimes that our colleagues are human as well. And so the things which we read in research which are related to children often relate directly to what we're doing with our colleagues and, and parents in the community. And, and relationships are central to everything so some fantastic advice there Hayley thank you very much and uh, Vicky have you got any uh, response to the same question about how you go about growing members in your team you, you shared a moment ago about how um, fantastically um, and the rapport and the relationships have been with uh, your team um, since you started working at, at BISAD uh, have you got any advice about how to go about growing members so that you can create that sort of culture you, you talked about yeah, I think for me, I think probably one of the best CPD things I've sort of ever done in my teaching career is I trained with um, CTI as a life coach. Um, and that's really, really informed my leadership practice in that I have learned sort of techniques and ways to really get to understand people's values and really speak to their values. 
Um, and I think once you sort of understand, uh, sort of as Haley said, once you understand your people, you can really understand, you know, what their hopes and what they, what their vision for their own futures is, and you can sort of help them to to realise that within the school. I think f for me, there was there's a thing. I think it's in the Cheryl Sandberg book about women that um, the best kind of women leaders are the women that lean back and pull other women forward. Um, and I've sort of tried to apply that ethos to everyone within my team that, you know, I am i don't have some sort of ego situation that I think that I always need to be in charge or the best. What what gives me the greatest satisfaction is, is seeing other people grow and seeing them sort of... Um, contribute more and more to the school and get themselves into leadership roles and that sort of thing so um, I'm always sort of trying to look for ways to help people find like CPD or find experiences or opportunities for them to try mm. new things so I think that's really really important. Brilliant thank you very much uh, Vicky. N Neil what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think they have to be, for any kind of development to happen in your team, they, I think people have to feel in your team like they're, they're a stakeholder in some sense to the vision that you're, you're trying to achieve. So, I, you know, I think of departments that I've worked in that have, have gone well. Um, and There's always been a shared sense of purpose there. And I think it, in good times or bad, we've always been able to come back to the, you know, the core driver, which, which you would revisit every Every difficult decision, you, you go back to your core principles, which everyone has bought into, everyone has developed together. Um, and I think if people feel that, then you, you're going to, there's clarity of where you're going. There's autonomy there for people to division, uh, to develop the you know, vision that, that they were part of. And I think when you have that, you can start to push people as well to, you know, you start to then you build that professional trust because it's it is a team they're you know they're part of the team they're not just a mm. a member they're a they're a working part of it um and then you know Haley's hopefully <laughs> Haley's hopefully a great example um given a given a little nudge that, to come on here this evening and I think you, once you get to know those people like Vicky was talking about you know what motivates them what drives them you find out why it is they're doing what they're doing you can start to guide them towards opportunities and then I think hopefully that's where the the magic starts to happen Brilliant. Thank you very much, Neil. You okay for the next question, Ollie? Yeah, I was, I was just trying to uh, get a tweet out, but we're there. Um, so let's say let's let's draw on a little thread there. Then that, um, that, that some of you have mentioned. Um, let's say that you identify that there's a need to build trust then within the members or a member of your team. Um, what actions might you undertake to to start fostering that tr that trust, either amongst the person or or the team as a whole? Um, I'll, get, I'll jump in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think uh, you have to just, you have to lead by example. So if you need to be the leader that your team want you to be, um, and again, linking it back to those relationships, once you've built those effective relationships with your team, hopefully that trust just naturally begins to kind of grow. Um, and once they see that you're leading as they would hope or they would want you to lead um everything just kind of comes together um you communicate with them you make sure that uh, like we've mentioned that you give them opportunity to grow you give them opportunity to to try things out to take risks um and then hopefully all of those things just kind of combine and um that trust just kind of naturally grows uh within what you're doing as with you and the team um Brilliant. Thank you, Hayley. Uh, Vicky, what's your response to that? Um, I think sometimes they, I, I totally agree with what Hayley said. I think it's really important to kind of build that trust. But I think sometimes it's really helpful. Like I've only been at BISAD for just over a year now to, to start by establishing norms and to establish like in meetings and things like that. And when you have kind of one-to-ones with staff that they know that the, your discussions are confidential and that, you know, that you, you've got their back and you want the best for them. And um, so I think that, that I wouldn't feel awkward 
now I think perhaps when I first started off as a leader I felt a bit weird about like oh let's should we establish some norms for how we're going to go on um but I don't feel that anymore I think that's a real good way to create coherence and trust and that what Neil was talking about that kind of shared vision earlier and I think if people feel comfortable and confident um, and they know that they're respected and that you know what what in our department meetings what's discussed in our team is is kind of confidential and and that makes everyone feel happy and comfortable to to share what they feel they need to share so how, how do you go about building that in your in your um discussions then vicky do you do you, do you say outwardly that they're confidential or, or do you uh, is that made really clear and explicit in the conversations that you have yeah, definitely. I think there's always, I think in that, again, sort of part of my coaching training that you always begin a coaching meeting by re-establishing the norms and saying, you know, anything that's aired today sort of stays within these four walls and, you you know, you, then people are confident to to be honest. But we, we sort of have a caveat that you if you're going to bring problems to the table, then it should be a solution focus. It should be asking for help and asking for other people's experience and direction and I think that creating that sort of collaborative trust um, is a really good way to sort of just create a really good atmosphere that's really positive so even if negative things are being talked about it's done so in a way that we can we're, we're, we're looking to move forward from this rather than dwell on like what yeah. we're upset about or what's not working that's great advice. Thank you very much, Vicky. Neil, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I've written down a quote. It was one of my one of my few quotes I'm going to use because I try not to go for the. I think sometimes you can get hooked into a really good leadership quote that you think is inspirational, but the practical application sometimes are a bit a bit harder. But it's an it's an Angela Merkel one, and she says much better to talk to one another than about one another, um, mm -hmm. and that's one that really rings true to me because I think. The times where I've been unhappiest in my in my life or in my career is sort of when there's been the sense of ambiguity, where either you don't know you don't know how you where you stand with someone, or you don't know um, you don't know what's coming next, or that uncertainty. And I think you have to get to a point in your team where you feel comfortable disagreeing with each other. And I think when people feel safe, when people start to feel safe, and and that trust is there then the, the discussions are just so much better and I, you know i think you have to you have to work through that together and have frank frank but fair discussions where you can say you know I, <laughs> we had one in the in our team the other day where i had an idea that i thought was great and, and actually nobody else thought it was great and we did we didn't do it and that's fine because um i think you know if you get that culture right then people in all directions of you up up down and to the side can say to you um, exactly exactly how they're feeling and as long as it's reciprocal um, so I, I think I think you have to you have to encourage that uh, with the people who are around you and perhaps the people who are, are working as part of your team to start with and you have to invite invite their feedback on and then in the first instance of, of criticism or in the instances where they, they maybe don't like what you're doing you have to show them that they're they're willing to listen to it as well. Because I think if you if you ask people for feedback and you never listen to it, it just it very quickly becomes not authentic. And then there's the danger that people don't tell you what they really think or what they really feel, and and then things stop getting better. Um, so I, I promise no more. Hopefully, no more no more cliches and no more quotes. But I think uh, I think you have to strive for those honest, open, frank conversations in all directions as often as you can. Uh, thank you for that, Neil. And and uh, I really like the fact that um, it goes back to that uh, the thing that was talked about earlier about sort of leadership by example, um, because you're taking on board the feedback from your colleagues. You had this great idea to whatever it was, do whatever you thought you you thought was a great idea, but to listen to your colleagues and then respond to that in a positive way, <clears throat> and then not do it because of the advice shared within your team is a, it's just a great example of leadership. And with that, I'm just going to disappear. <laughs> I just want to pick up on a thread there that um, we're kind of talking about it without, we're talking about a dimension of it without um, 
without sort of acknowledging it. Um, what would your top tips be then for running a successful department meeting? If everyone could just kind of give your, your top two tips. Um, if we will go along the top and, and, and down to Vicky at the end. So Neil, if you want to start. Um, I think you need you need to get your um, your person who's really keen on your processes and procedures in charge of your minutes, and you have to get your real attention, get your attention to detail person onto your minutes. Uh, and although I like to think I'm a, I am an attention to detail person, I think um, this a long suffering member of our team last year, Yaz, and she was the she was the champion of the agenda, and whatever we were discussing uh, it was always her job to try and bring it back round to the agenda and to bring it back around to focusing on what it was we were supposed to be doing. And and that leads us to point number two, which I think is, is something I'm, I, again, I'm guilty of, I hold my hands up, is that you could, I, I find myself philosophizing a lot, probably doing it now um, in meetings. I think Vicky touched on it earlier on, where it's easy when you're discussing a process or how you want to do something that you, before you know it, you could find yourself talking about in an ideal world, we would do this, or wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great? Or it's, it's annoying that we can't. I think you have to try and, as often as you can, keep bringing it back round to, okay, so what are we going to do? So how are we going to, how are we going to do it? Um, and as many of those um, refocusers as you can, uh, they would be my two bits of advice. That's great. Thank you, uh, Haley. We come to you next, please. Um, I think enabling or having enough time to to do the collaboration um, side of things so whether you're trying to make changes to something or you are having to discuss um, something that you're wanting to to do or change in your team just having enough time set aside during that meeting to collaborate and to, to work on that um, is point number one but also keeping it concise and to the point um, not having a meeting for the sake of a meeting and trying to drag it out if you don't need to have everybody there if it's not um, a good use of their time um, if it can be done and finished within 10-15 minutes and that's all it needs to be then I think yeah keeping it keeping it to the point and making sure that when there is time for um, that collaboration and that sharing of ideas to make sure that you have enough time to do that in that meeting. Great, thank you, Vic. Hundred percent agree on the uh, not wasting people's time in meetings. I think we've all been enough in enough of them in the past. It's like <laughs> not been here anymore. Um, so yeah, I really agree with that. I think um, try for me. I'm always can it, if you can send it in an email, send it in an email. Don't waste people's time with a meeting. And I always try like when I'm sort of thinking about our next kind of department meetings. I'm thinking. You know, is this really focused on improving learning? And is oh, are we thinking about teaching and learning here, or is this just process and it just things that are wasting people's time? Really, I think, yeah, just go for an email if it's process stuff, um, and just try and keep meetings focused on, you know, what are we as a team doing to improve learning, and how are we get in there, and how are we making it stick as well? Because I think. Uh, you know, the longer you you are within the school system, you've sort of seen all these innovations and great ideas come and go. Um, but really to make people feel really satisfied in what they're doing, they need to be able to, to see it actually in reality and to see it every day and think, yeah, that's really good. I was a part of making that happen. So, yeah, try and make it stick, make it about improving teaching and learning. That's a, a great point that you've made there, Vic. I know that you'll you'll testify to this. We use Office 365 and uh, the Planner app um, is such a useful. She's giggling. She knows, you know, all that agency <laughs> stuff can just be done through the Planner app, and that frees up your time to actually spend it on what will make more of a difference, which is, you know, focusing on teaching and learning and, and professional development within your teams. And that's that's such a, a rich use of your time as a team that you know if you can make and harness tools like that to get rid of all the processy things and, and email them out it's it's far easier and we've had a question come in from uh, danielle thanks for tuning in danielle middle leaders under so much pressure to show impact uh, how do you think 
how do you think the best way to achieve this quickly is? Um, Vic, we'll come back to you because you went last last time, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think data is the key to this. Find mm -hmm. out the, what's the biggest need. Um, and then usually if you find the biggest need, then the the steps that you take to ameliorate, ameliorate an issue with that or to create a better condition for those students will sort of, it naturally kind of follows that that will show the biggest improvement. Um, and again, don't try and do too much. I think, um, especially like reflecting on myself as when I first became a middle leader, my department development plans were about 16 pages long and I just wanted to change the world and do everything. And you're at real risk of burning out your on yourself when you, um, you can't um, prioritize those things. But certainly for me, data is the key. Just look at your students' data, look at your teachers' data, um, and then you'll find the gaps, that, that the biggest gaps that need to be closed. Um, and that will give you the biggest win, I think, in terms of sort of proving yourself um, and, and actually demonstrating an impact. That's really interesting. I think I think you're absolutely right on that that front, Vicky. Jumping to you for a second, Haley, because say you 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 may well be in this position right now, being new to the role. Um, I, Noel will be able to sort of tell me whether or not it's true or not. But there may be some pressure on you to show impact really, really quickly. And certainly, um, having both been been interviewed for middle leader roles and having interviewed people who are applying for middle leader roles one of those questions is often you know how can you show impact in your first month your first hundred days all those sorts of things as well um, how, how are you finding that sort of pressure um around that question for yourself um so i think just in general i think only being five weeks into the role i think just generally i feel quite a bit of pressure on am I doing the right thing and, and is this the right way to go and um, so I think that's just me as a person I'm quite a bit of a worrier and want to make sure I'm doing things the right way um, so for me I think there is some pressure but also I think um, SLT have been quite good in making sure that we're all well supported um, to be able to show that impact as and when we need to um, I think Neil touched on it before at the moment, we're trying to get the children back into the classroom, back comfortable, making sure that they're safe, that their well-being is looked after. And that's kind of what we're working on at this present moment in time. And then you'll start to bring in all the all the other kind of side of it, the educational side and making sure that everybody's making the correct progress. And then um, that's when I think there'll be a bit more pressure coming on um, to me and I'll have to kind of work with my team to to make sure that we can show that progress. Um, I think having had however long it was now, six months out of the classroom, I think you're always kind of trying to find ways to bridge that gap that perhaps has um, kind of grown between some of the children um, during that time. So. I'm pretty sure as the year progresses, there'll be more pressure put onto me. Um, but I think at the moment, we're just focusing on making sure that those children are, are safe and their well-being is looked after. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for that response, Hayley. I'm just going to jump onto another question now, if that's all right, because I'm mindful. Um, I said time flies. We're down to 12 minutes left on, on the show. And so um, yeah, we've, got, we've still got a lot of things we'd like to try and get through. I'm, I'm going to pose this question to uh, Neil, if that's OK, Neil. Um, delegation, uh, is, I'm, I'm going to combine two questions here, actually. Um, delegation is an important part of the role of a leader in sharing the workload and and, and all the things that need to be worked on and, and, and all of these things. Um, so um, what, first of all, can middle leaders do to make their delegation more effective? And then sort of following on from that, um, one of the, and this has been a conversation I've had many times over the years, um, but uh, in your view, do you think it's like a head of department's uh, responsibility to create a, a scheme of work for every class or a scheme of learning for every class? Or is that something um, that um, sh should be delegated and shared out? And if you think it is something that should be done uh, by a middle leader for every class, how do you manage that work? And if not, so how do you go about delegating that sort of thing out to your teams? Sorry for the big question, Neil. 
Yeah, I mean, you've, you've, <laughs> you've tossed me on that. And that's not just a, a single, but a, a, a double there. Uh, I'll, I'll try and go through it in reverse order, if that's all right. Um, I, I don't think it's the job of the, the department head to do that. I, I do think they have to play some role in in controlling the vision because, you, you, like I think, like Vicky touched on, um, you can't can't do everything all the time. At some point, there mm -hmm. has to be a distilling down and a, a narrowing a little bit. And uh, once you've got the collection of ideas, and I think you you give people the the autonomy and the freedom to voice what they want to do, and you make them a stakeholder in it. I do think your your job does start though at that point of once you've collected it and there are decisions to make. That's where you you, you know as a middle leader, you do have to make some of those decisions um, when faced with equally good options, and and that's part of the role. But that that's not something that I've ever again I've ever tried to control. I think when I started as in middle leader in this in my current role. Um, I think the first thing I did was try to sort of say, look, this is my vision. This is this is who I am. This is what I'm about, and this is where I think we should be going, and this is where I want it to go. And then gather ideas from other people who who are there. And then I think once you've got that, the, the delegation starts to become a little bit easier. And I think um, you can't get caught in just delegate delegating the tasks that you want to do. Sometimes you have to delegate the things that actually you know you really like doing because I think it's about still responsibility and I think going back to one of those the, the recurring themes that's been through the show is that you, you know you should be trying to develop people and develop your team and mm. the touch on Danielle's question as well that you know if you want to show impact you need to make sure you, you know your subject know the people that are working for you and know what their strengths are and whilst we're developing weaknesses you have to help people shine with their strengths as well and I think you different people in your team have got different skills and good leaders take full advantage of them they capitalize on the strengths of people in their in their teams and they help up, they help them to become strengths of everyone as well and i think you know you're going to find yourself as a middle leader either giving advice to someone who knows more about it than you or saying or holding your hands up and saying actually i i don't know as much about this as you do you mind telling me or would you mind taking a lead on that and i think that's where it's a, an attribute of good leaders yeah, that's, that's a great response. Thank you very much, Neil. I, I, I really like that sort of shared um, I think distilling of responsibility you said there. Um, and and it, is, it is difficult um, to put your hand up and say, I don't know everything about everything and, and take on board that. But again, that's that sort of brave leadership, isn't it? Um, Vicky, um, going on to um, the same question to you, um, but how, how do you um, sort of go about delegating within your teams? How, how, how do you approach that? I'm, I'm terrible at delegating. <laughs> um, yeah, I, no, I'm not terrible. At, well, I suppose I probably am a bit terrible at it. Um, I think, it, yeah, I think what Neil was saying about just finding people's strengths and what they're interested in, I think once you know that, you've got a good idea that you can create opportunities for people with things. So rather than it being like, a, you must do this, you must do that, it's more of a, like, is this something that you're interested in doing? Um, I think you'd be really good at it um, and kind of giving people those opportunities. Um, but I was really interested in your, just to curveball you a little bit, um, about your question about um, writing schemes of work and stuff. Because in within my yeah. sort of faculty, I've got like six different subjects. So for me, it's actually impossible um, to yeah. write. I'm not a history subject specialist. I'm not an economic specialist. I'm not a business studies specialist. So... Um, I think for me, that's more a question about what does good pedagogy look like? What does good assessment look like? And those are the kind of conversations that I'd rather be having um, and then sort of um, give people, because teachers are really passionate about their subjects as well. And I don't know if mm. this is just humanities thing, but the historians are really excited about history. And I think they'd be really upset if I started trying to write schemes of work for them. I think they'd be very disappointed. Um, so I think that kind of just talking about what does good look like um, and giving people a bit more rain, because that's where the passion comes from. I think I've been involved in like standards based assessments in a previous school, and I think it just completely pulled all the love of the subject out of a lot of teachers um which is not a great thing to see and so giving people the opportunity to create 
schemes of learning about their passions and what we as a team think is important. Um, I think it's um, a really empowering thing to do. No, I, I completely agree with what you're saying there as well. And, and it goes in some way, actually, with the, with the comment you've made there <laughs> about playing to the strengths of the subject you have working uh, in your... Because I've been in a similar position to yourself um, and um, sort of led in departments where I, I haven't taught the subject. I think it goes in some way as well to the sort of the fallacies we've discovered over the years with classroom observations as well, hasn't it? It's how can, you know, as a um, economics and business or a computing expert, how can I... You know, coming to your classroom and I'm, I'm assuming from our conversation this evening you're a geography teacher so how could I come into one of your lessons and, and proclaim to give you advice on how to teach your subject when I don't really know anything about your subject uh, it, it goes to those things doesn't it I think um Hayley um how, how do you feel about this this idea of, of uh, delegation um I think I'm a bit like Vicky I think at the moment I'm not very good at uh sort of delegating tasks and trying to get everything done as I should be doing it as the year four leader I need to get all of those tasks done um so it's definitely something that I'm gonna try and work on um over the rest of my middle leader career um but yeah definitely try and find as they've said the strengths of of the people in your team there's no point in me trying to sit there trying to do something that I have no idea about or I'm not very good at if somebody can get it done a lot quicker um, and easier than I can. Um, mm. And also I think just being clear as well. So in this is what we need to do and this is where we want to go as a team um, and kind of guiding them and being clear with what kind of your expectations are as well so that you then don't end up repeating the task yourself um, a bit later on if it's not quite as you had thought it might have gone. But again, I think that's probably me just needing to let them go with it and kind of delegate. I think that's definitely something that I need to work on. Uh, Mark, I'm mindful of time. Go on, Ali. We've, we've got four minutes left. Uh, <laughs> mindful of the time. Um, we're going to jump to one of the two questions that we ask every guest um, at the end of each show, which is, uh, could you just um, recommend a, a, a non-educational book that's had an impact positively on you as an educator uh, or as a leader, please. Uh, we'll go to Neil first, please. Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I tend to read more, I tend to be a serial Wikipedia troller, to be honest, and uh, the books I do read, I do, I do delve into my fiction quite a lot. Um, I, I'll cheat a little bit, and I'm going to say We Need to Speak About Kevin is a, is a book that uh, I carry with me not physically, but uh, a book that had a profound impact on me, and that was about, uh, you know, if you haven't read it, it's, uh, it's, it could be a bit of an, an arduous read, but that was one about um, a, a, a school tragedy in America um, and a, a difficult home life and difficult circumstances. And I think the same summer I read that along with Curious Incident of the, the Dog in the Night. And the reason I, I sort of point to those two books is just that, you know, everyone is... We, we, get, we, we visited at the start, it, it goes for pupils as well, everyone has their own story, everyone has their home life, everyone has their own background and books like that remind me that, you know, everyone is, everyone's just trying to do their best and everyone's just trying to get on in life and be happy and it's colleagues that you work with and it's kids at school and they all have, we, you know, we all have that right to feel, feel like we belong and feel like we're accepted in, in where we are and they remind me often to just calm down, stop, think about it, think about the person. That's a, a great recommendation. I think one I need to add to my list. Uh, Hayley, will you come to you next, please? Um, a bit a bit like Neil here. I'm, that's a bit of a question that I'm a bit like, ooh, about. Personally, I love to read, but I tend to read kind of romance, crime, fiction books. Um, but I think definitely need to kind of broaden my reading um repertoire so if anybody wants to send me their amazing book recommendations feel free i think as a primary school teacher though for me um just a picture books in general for me uh, no matter what age the children that you're teaching are you can always get great reading great writing great ideas from a picture book um mm. so i just love to share those with with my class and the, the children that i'm teaching 
Um, so not really anything that's had a profound impact on, on me as an educator necessarily, but just something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, yeah, any good re book recommendations, do send them away because I do love to read. We'll have to send some over to you after the show, Hayley. Yeah. How about yourself, <laughs> How about yourself, Vicky? Um, I think for, for me, like I had a bit of a like massive light bulb moment before I was a teacher, I, I worked in all sorts of other various industries. Um, and my sort of conception of what a leader was, was always quite a kind of masculine thing. And, and, I, and then I read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg and I found out about imposter syndrome and I was like, oh my God, it's really real. Um, so that I think was really important for me. It just really changed me and made me a lot more confident in my leadership and, and like anything by Brene Brown and that whole idea of it's all right to be a vulnerable leader and it's all right to to be, you know, to, to tell people that you, you don't know everything and you really need their help. Um, I think that's this kind of leader that I'm really comfortable being and that I, I want to be and to be proud of. So, yeah, anything by Brene Brown is pretty amazing, really. Brilliant, shares. Thank you so much, Vicky. And uh, I'm just going to jump on to our very final question uh, of the evening. Uh, and I'll jump to you first, Hayley, if that's OK. Uh, what EdTech tool makes your working life easier and why? Uh, so uh, it could be anything. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try and steer you with your response. But uh, what EdTech tool does help you with, with, with your work? Um, I think for, uh, at the moment with kind of COVID times and um, was uh, recommended by a colleague, um, a website, and I think it's an app as well called uh, Go Noodle. So it just mm -hmm. gives the children brain breaks. They're, they're in their seats pretty much all day, every day, almost every single lesson, um, and they're finding it really tough. Um, so it's silly, it's crazy. The kids absolutely love it. Um, but just having that time to have a brain break um, it makes my life easier because they can then um, get on with the work in the next lesson once they've had that that moment of being silly and kind of giving them that release of energy that they need. Um, so at the moment, I'm absolutely loving that. Um, but also something that we started using uh, during distance learning uh, that Neil recommended was um, Flipgrid. Uh, I'm sure lots of people have been using it as well. Mm -hmm. But just giving the children the opportunity to record videos, um, share their work. Um, it was particularly good during the distance learning. There was a couple of children who um, found it quite difficult to speak in front of other children in the class. They didn't like to share their ideas, however, using this because nobody else could kind of see them because it was them being recorded it was just amazing the things that they were coming out with um so yeah those are my two for, for the moment brilliant stuff thank you both good choices as well thank you very much indeed for those Hayley uh, and uh, over to you Vicky for your um choice please my choice is Ollie Lewis <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything that comes to Wally is usually good. Um, no, but I think for me, like my lifesaver, I think during our virtual school experience was quizzes. I know it's not particularly revolutionary, but um, mm. just a it's just a really easy to use thing. Um, time saving, kids absolutely love it as well, um, and the fact that you can kind of um, teleport questions in, you can create really yeah. good easy questions i love that but ollie was talking about earlier as well the um planner thing in microsoft i'm i've come yeah. from a good school so this last 12 months has been mental for me learning all the different kind of microsoft apps but i've actually found them really really good um and my learning curve has been humongous but that's been a particularly useful thing for me Brilliant stuff. Yeah, huge fan of quizzes here as well as the whole whole Office 365 suite, to be fair. Um, and, and it is that there, there is such a, a steep learning curve, isn't there? We're, we're trying we're really sort of trying to adopt uh, new ed tech. So you're lucky to have Ollie there to uh, uh, sort of benchmark those things and give you ideas and support you and, and, and things. But um, yeah, huge, huge, huge fan of quizzes. Um, it's it's a brilliant tool. Um, and uh, the final word on the ed tech choices, uh, Neil. Uh, and and uh, 
you say you, you, you've got Flipgrid, Go Noodle, Microsoft Planner, and Quizzes. I mean, I mean do you have a sort of NASA uh, equivalent of? Uh, <laughs> awesome I, I have got what, what I think are the two two most underrated tools in the in the Office three six five suite. Uh, number one is Immersive Reader, which we which we we know use well. Um, and if you haven't used it, Immersive Reader's Office inbuilt accessibility tool that can change the speed of text. It can read it out to children. It can display words or sentences in different languages. It's got an inbuilt picture dictionary to it. Um, it can space out words. It can highlight nouns, adjectives, verbs. Change the background of the paper that it's on. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic tool that can mm. save teachers a lot of time. Uh, second one is, a, is a, a double whammy. When writing reports this year for the first time, I used the dictate function on Microsoft Word. It's absolutely brilliant. It's very accurate if you haven't used it before, as long as you speak slowly and clearly. So I, I dictated all my reports. It took me a, a fraction of the time that it did before. And then I used the read aloud function, which is kind of part of Immersive Reader afterwards for the proofreading. And caught the errors far more active, uh, far more accurately because it's actually reading out to you what you've written, so you hear when the mistakes are. I know that sounds like a really simple thing, but sometimes when you read a big wall of text, it's hard to spot an error. But when mm. a voice is actually reading it back to you, the errors are obvious. You can tell where you've missed punctuation, where you've got the wrong word, where a sentence doesn't make sense. So there are my two, two ed tech and also time saving tips for teachers. I think, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Immersive Reader. Um, but I think that's a fantastic little hack there, using Immersive Reader to actually just listen back to stuff afterwards and use it as a thing tool. What's lovely about it too is you could be doing the washing up whilst that's reading it back to you. It, 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 it frees you from your keyboard. And particularly given how you've been having it in your schools for the past sort of seven, eight months, when you are in front, it, it, it is really difficult to see the wood for the trees, isn't it, Neil? With the, um, with, with, when, when you're sort of facing a big wall of text and you've been sitting there for you know, two hours writing comments for the 30 students in your class and stuff. So that's a brilliant hack and some great suggestions. Um, we are over time. We are seven minutes and 21 seconds over time, in fact. Uh, so um, I'm going to start to wrap things up here. But um, just want to say a big thank you to um, our viewers this evening. And if you're watching back, uh, please do feel free to leave comments on YouTube or uh, via mine and Ollie's Twitter. We're always keen to hear from our audience. Um, but um, huge, huge, huge thanks uh, this evening. Uh, go to our three very special guests uh, who have joined us here this evening. Uh, the first is uh, Neil. Neil Statham uh, from um, um, schools, schools in Dubai, isn't it? Uh, we've, yeah. And uh, we've got uh, Hayley as well from Heartland in Dubai as well. Uh, to Vicky Duet uh, from Bissad as well. Thank you, all three of you, uh, so much for joining us on the show. And uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Uh, please hit the subscribe button. Um, when you do that, you can see our sh up and coming shows. Uh, you can choose to get a little reminder so you get a little notification when the show's about to go live so you'll never miss uh, an episode. Uh, feedback from our, our audiences tell us that it's much better to actually engage with the show when it is live. Uh, so you can do just as uh, Mark Ryan has done this evening, uh, asking questions like this one we responded to earlier. Uh, such as Danielle sent through earlier. Uh, and our guests are always happy, as are Ollie and I, to take on board your questions and comments and things uh, to feed into what we do on the live show. But for now, uh, it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from Ollie. And uh, I I'm not going to speak for Neil, Haley, and uh, Vicky because they've all spoken so uh, eloquently this evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on Learn Live UAE. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.